to read our portion of Scripture together this morning. Moving a little slow today, not like a guy from New Jersey. We're usually pretty quick, even if we don't know where we're going. We move really fast. We are going to read together from the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter, verses 30 to 38. This is not a Christmas message, even though it sounds like that text that we're going to be reading together. Luke 1, verses 30 through 38. Let's read together. In respect to the Word of God, we stand. It says, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father, please bless your word today. O Father, drive it home by your Holy Spirit to the hearts of your people. On this rainy Sunday, might it be a blessing? Might it be an encouragement? Might it be the inspiration needed to move through these upcoming days, weeks, months, as long as you tarry your coming and be close to you and to be filled with your wisdom? Thank you that your word does not return void, and we're counting on that today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated, folks. We have started a new series called Longing to Belong, and uh, today we are looking at Mary's prayer and uh, a very, very exciting portion of Scripture. Uh, Looking at it the last two weeks, the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 and 2 just got me all stirred up and excited, and I hope the Word of God has that effect on you when you read it. I need it. I need to be encouraged. I need to be inspired. I need to know that God is in control, and I know as I read His Word that He brings that to mind and to heart over and over again. Uh, Luke 1 alone, the great, great angel Gabriel, uh, giving announcement after announcement. What a fierce angel. The fiercest angels mentioned in the Word of God are Gabriel, who is the announcer of things, and Michael, who is the guardian angel of the nation Israel. What What a fiery, impressive, awesome angel of God who is constantly with a drawn sword prepared for war. Gabriel makes an announcement to two moms, Mary and her cousin Elizabeth, to two dads, Joseph and Zacharias, who was a priest ministering uh, in the temple. And we find that the names of these boys that will be born are given by God. God says through Gabriel, your son Mary will be called Jesus, which was such an exciting thing. And Elizabeth, who was barren in her old age, was told that her son would be named John. And he would be John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one who would give the announcement 
concerning Jesus and proclaim that famous verse, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now, Zacharias, uh, this is Mother's Day, and we're lifting up moms. Sometimes we as men are the ones with the problem, are the ones that have difficulty demonstrating faith. And I'm not saying all the time, and I know we take turns and we are an encouragement to each other, but Zacharias was a priest. And he went into the temple, he was in the presence of God, offering incense, Gabriel appears, and we find he gives the announcement of John being bored, born, excuse me, and Zacharias has difficulty accepting it. And because he has difficulty accepting it, he is struck dumb. He suddenly can't talk at all. And the people are outside the temple waiting for the priest, Zacharias, to come out to proclaim the message from God. And he comes out and he can't talk. He comes out and he is silent and they're not quite sure what has taken place. But after John the Baptist is born, the people, like they had a say in the matter, they start arguing about what the child will be named. And they said it should be Zacharias like his father. Even though the angel has said his name will be John, and Zacharias takes a tablet, not the kind we know about, and he marks down his name is John, showing he finally had faith, and he was finally accepting God's plan for what it was, and immediately he could speak, because he was now on board. This didn't happen to Mary, because Mary accepted with great excitement and anticipation everything that the angel said to her. Now this morning, with it being Mother's Day, we are examining a teenage virgin girl who is engaged to be married to what I think was a pretty handsome dude named Joseph, and she's excited She's going through the normal things that people engage, go through. Jewish folks like to party. They like to do things in a celebratory type way. There were things going on. There were gifts being given. There was great anticipation. The girls were talking. And suddenly, the angel breaks into the scene and says, you are going to have a baby. And she's quite amazed by that because she has not had any relations whatsoever with a man, and that confuses her just a little bit, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I want you to notice Mary's devotion. Teenage girl, I'll keep saying that, teenage girl, teenage girl, her devotion, her trust, her her anticipation, ultimately her prayer. The angel Gabriel is sent to a town called Nazareth. And we find she, as I said, was engaged to Joseph. One writer made a great statement. He said, when the power of the highest stooped to overshadow the lowly Mary, it was indeed a manifestation of mild mightiness. I've never heard anything like that. That God could show himself in a mild way through a teenage girl, and yet it was mighty. And it was kind of what was echoed in the Old Testament when David said in 2 Samuel 22 in the last part of verse 36, your gentleness has made me great. Kind of the same line of thinking. We can get quiet before God and He can do great things. We can walk quietly with anticipation. And as long as we're doing things the right way, God can come through in a powerful, powerful way. So this was my reason to examine a mom who had motherhood cast on her. 
That's not normally the way it happens. Normally there's preparation, and hopefully if it's done the right way, there are a series of events. And I realize that a lot of times people end up pregnant and there wasn't a series of events, it wasn't planned, it wasn't done the right way. We live in the age of the Mori Poviches. You are the father. You know, let's check the DNA and see who it is, you know, and we're like, oh my, you know, why did I have to pass by this as I was going, you know, to the Red Sox game? You know, ridiculous, terrible things that are lifted up as exciting and newsworthy, and they're simply making fools of themselves, but thank God whatever crazy things happen for motherhood to be cast on a woman, God recognizes the child right? Of no fault of their own. They're a soul created by God. And thank God that God is mindful of that little one. So I want us to look at a mother and first off, the promise. If you'll read with me again, verses 30 and 31. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Mary, you're going to be a mom. Different than the doctor or the nurse or, you know, the nurse practitioner coming out of a room and saying, you know, you tested positive, it's blue, you know. You're pregnant, you know. The angel said, you're going to be a mom, and in the future, she was going to be admired by all. She wasn't going to be admired at that present time. She had an awful lot to go through. And you know, even when Christ was 12 years old and they brought him to Jerusalem into the temple and Simeon and Anna was there, one of the prophecies was that her own heart would be pierced with a sword. So she was going to go through some stuff. Right, moms? Do moms go through some stuff and it affects them differently than dads? Sure does, you know? So she was going to suffer she was going to, in her present day, be rejected by the people. Everyone was naming their firstborn son Jesus because they were all hoping that they would give birth to the Messiah. They knew the prophecies. And this young girl says, an angel told me I'm pregnant, I'm going to give birth. And they probably said, yeah, right. What have you and handsome Joseph been up to. And here is a young virgin girl with integrity. You know, I remember my daughter giving her that special purity ring when she was, I don't know, 17. We had come home from camp and I bought her a very special ring. Naturally, she said it had to be expensive. You know, I said it should, it should only have to be a string just to remind you, but it was precious. Talking about purity. Talking about doing things the right way. Talking about God in her life. Talking about how she should be treated. Talking about her value, her worth, being fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Moms, we need to instill that stuff over everything else into the lives of your kids, and I don't care if they're grown. Keep on instilling it. Grandmas, moms, dads, fathers. The most important thing that we instill into the lives of people. The angel said, fear not. Yeah, right. Can you imagine Gabriel appearing in your bedroom in the middle of the night? I don't think he was my height. I don't think he was 5'7". You know, and looked like me. I, I kind of picture like a nine-foot angel, perfect, glistening, with a sword hanging at his side. At his side, and when he announced something, he whispered it, but the whole area resonated with his voice. 
something pretty cool. These angels were sharp, and they could go across the heavens, and it would look like a shooting star. Don't be afraid. What could she have feared? (laughs) The angel itself. God doing something in her life. I guess to a lesser degree, she could have feared the plan that he talked about. God's timing. Ultimately giving up control. Isn't that what we love control? You're telling me that I'm not going to go the normal way here? I'm not going to have all the events that an engaged young girl gets? I'm suddenly going to have to walk around and say that I'm pregnant before my wedding? Even though the engagement for a Jewish person was very much part of the wedding procedure, she still was not married yet. So understand how she felt, especially as the months passed. And she began to show. I'm sure she was a laughingstock. I'm sure nobody believed her but Joseph, who had been spoken to in a dream to support her. But I think the biggest part of this that caused her to fear, you'll have a son. Okay, cool. His name will be Jesus. Excuse me? Jesus. You know. You know the prophecies, Mary. His name will be Jesus. I think that's what blew her away. Now you know we wrestle sometimes in the day we live in with Mary being exalted, lifted up as the mother of heaven, uh, put on a level of worship, almost like a co-redemptrix next to the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the only thing that comes close to that is verses, uh, verse 30 in particular, when it says she found favor with God. I think that's as close as we get. But even then, Mary being lifted up in worship, it's just not seen. Remember the story of the transfiguration where Christ went to that mountain with the closest of disciples, the three, Peter, James, and John, And they went there and suddenly Moses and Elijah appear. And Jesus starts talking to them about the crucifixion. And Jesus, his appearance is altered. And the Shekinah glory of God is on his face. And he is just radiating. And Peter, as always, comes up with a great idea. He says, Lord, it would really be cool if we built three monuments, three idols, technically, One to Moses, one to Elijah, and one to you. And then this booming voice to come down from heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And then Moses and Elijah go, (laughs) and they're gone. But it says Jesus was still there. Jesus is the superstar, not Mary. Mary needed exactly what we need this morning and what we have embraced. Mary was ordinary. And all I mean is she was like us. She had the normal needs that you and I have. She was undeserving, just like we don't deserve God's grace. She was undeserving. She needed forgiveness for sin, she needed a Savior. She was simply the vehicle, the tool that God chose to use. And when it says she was highly favored, let me give you a a more definite illustration of what that means, a definition. It meant you who are graciously accepted. So highly favored doesn't mean you're above all things and you're to be worshipped. It means you're graciously accepted. Everybody here is graciously accepted by God's grace. She was no different in what her need was. She was spirit-filled. She was spirit-led. And most importantly, she was available. These are the most important things we need to teach our kids. And then, if that didn't blow her away... Look at verse 32 and 33. Gabriel 
highlights a little bit what Jesus was all about. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This is the baby that's going to be born to you, and your cousin Elizabeth is already six months along. And if we read on further, you'll see Mary go and spend some time with Elizabeth and say some phenomenal things, some faith-filled words that'll just stir your heart. He will be great. He'll be called the son of the highest. He'll rule over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. Wow. Mary amazes me. I do not deify her, but I admire her trust, her humility, and the awe demonstrated in her life. It was a hard life, but it was an amazing existence. The second thing, the question. Very refreshing. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? It's a fair question. And she was not doubting. If she had been doubting, she probably would have been struck dumb. Just like Zacharias was. She was not doubting. That was not the intent of her statement. And I like that she said, how can this happen? I, don't, I haven't known a man. Isn't that refreshing? So often in our world, somebody says, you know, this is impossible. I wasn't with anyone. Must have been something in the water. You know, or something, you know, some bad cheese that you ate from Stop and Shop or something, you know, that you're suddenly pregnant. You know, it cracks me up when some of the, you know, these women, these young girls are like, huh, what happened? <laughs> really? You were there. You were there and you know exactly what happened. She is being sincere. Mary's like, how can this be? Seeing that I don't know a man. And she wasn't doubting. What she was actually asking the angel was, she didn't doubt, but she was wondering how God was going to pull this thing off. It was like, this is so cool. How are you going to do it? That's a pretty cool question. She was a teenager. Maybe she said, cool. I know she didn't say groovy. You know, that was in the, in the 60s when I was a little twerp. You know? Maybe she, I don't know what the word of the day was. Was it awesome? No, that was for God, right? But this was God. Maybe she said awesome. I don't know. But she said, how will this be accomplished in my life? It wasn't mistrust. It wasn't doubt. She didn't say, yeah, right. She didn't. She accepted it. And I look at this and I'm like, wow. What's the teaching here, moms? Hey kids, God is able to do anything. God can come through. It doesn't matter what you're feeling, what you're enduring, what you're experiencing. God is great. And God will come through for you if you lift Him up and you put Him first in your life. Not only teach it to your kids, teach it to your husbands. Teach it to your friends and relatives. Teach it to your neighbors. Mary showed that the greatest quality a mom can have is pointing her kids to God. Now let me say something. I'll put in a little ad here as a dad. When I was a child with my kids, my calendar looked like a Christmas tree. I did everything with them. Soccer three or four times a week, indoor and outdoor. Piano lessons. Dance recitals from the time my daughter was in kindergarten dressed up like a little clown. You know, just cute. She couldn't dance. You know, she just would pop her head up out of a crowd and smile at everybody, and they'd all, oh! You know, I mean, it was like, what was that? You know? Right up until a senior in high school 
wowing me at how great she was as she danced. That was all cool stuff. I messed around with my kids all the time. Jamie would visit me at the church and I'd come out with my chair on wheels in the hallway. She'd sit on my lap and I'd make it like six flags. I'd roll up and down the hallways with my daughter on my lap. And she would shriek and scream. We had so much fun. But that's not necessarily what made me a good dad. I told them about Jesus. I sat with them and told them, put God first. This is what God wants in your life. It's not the action-packed week I'm giving you and that I'm your coach at every sports activity. It's because of Jesus that they grew up okay. And each one of them has embraced the Lord. And the older one is up in Maine pastoring right now. And Jamie loves God like you wouldn't believe. That's what's important. I could have laid back on some of the activities. I wanted them to go on. I didn't want them to graduate high school and stop serving God and stop going to church. I wanted them to know what Jesus died for. And Mary knew that the greatest thing she could give her kids was a relationship with God. And let them know how vitally important all of their decisions were. Now the third thing this morning. The answer in verse 35. How can this be? I don't know a man. What a great answer. It's always the same. Verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Isn't that always the answer? How will this happen? The Holy Spirit. God is going to have to perform this through you as you make yourself available. If you have the time, open up to John 16 sometime. Read about the Holy Spirit. Read about His ministry. Read about what He does because He is presently doing it. I think it's a terrible thing when we talk about the Holy Spirit living within us and we don't really understand that at all. Or we wouldn't do what we do, we wouldn't say what we say, we wouldn't go where we go, we wouldn't perceive life situations the way that we do. If we understood that God lives in me, I'd live differently. And so would you. It would make a difference in your life if you acknowledge Christ lives in you and directs everything you do, and we either make him happy or sad, we either grieve him or quench him, which means kind of stop the workings of God in your life, dry up his ministry, even though he's there. I have had times in my life, tell me if you can relate, where I was not doing the right thing, and I'd hear the voice of God from within loudly, profoundly, don't do it, and I'd ignore it. And then I'd hear, don't do it. And then I'd ignore it more. Don't do it. And then I'd back up some more, keep trying to find out how to get away from him. Don't do it. And after a while, I couldn't hear him at all. He's still there. But I had grieved him. I had quenched him. God shouldn't have to shout to get our attention. He should only have to whisper, and we ought to hear him the first time, and say, speak, Lord for thy servant heareth. That's the way it's supposed to go. I know we rationalize. I know we grab the scriptures that suit our need in our life. And we can prove anything from the word of God. The cults have proved that. But you know what? It's not how you interpret it. It's interpreting it properly when you know what God is saying to you. So the Holy Spirit He accomplishes God's purpose in our life. He gives us gifts. He gives us fruit. He gives us God's plan. He is the revealer of direction. And I've shared this story with you before, but if you weren't here for it, years and years ago, I started a church down on Cape Cod. It grew. We built a building. God was just blessing. Another young man that I encouraged to come down 
Ben Feldot came down to Cape Cod and uh, was having a terrible time for about five years. This is where I preached recently, so things got better. But uh, he was very depressed, and he would come to our church on Sunday night for encouragement. We were having a missions conference, and I decided to have a road rally. You know, where we would give these tricky directions, and four or five houses would be chosen, and you had to look at the directions and decipher them and figure out where to go. So there'd be a driver and a navigator, and you would go to the first house, and that's where you'd get the appetizer, and you'd meet a missionary there. You'd go to the next house, you know, and maybe you'd get the salad. Maybe you'd go to the next house and get some soup, or maybe the soup and salad went together, I don't know. Then you'd go to the next house and you'd get the main course, and the final house was the dessert. Well, I remember I was driving with Ben. I was the driver, and he was the navigator, and Ben's pretty smart. So probably the first four clues, he worked out. I was quite impressed. And he's very prideful, too. So he was like, you make a right here, and then you make a left, and then, you know, and he would even tell you what was along the route. And it was like he had been there, done that, you know. And he was pretty cool for the first four points. But then we got to the fifth point, and he was like a little stifled. And he went, oh, oh make a left. Now, I knew everything. I was the driver and the pastor of the church. I knew where we were going. I didn't want to get lost because I knew what was being offered at those houses. And I didn't want it to be all gone when I got there. So he said, make a left. And under my breath, I said, oh, I don't think you want to do that. And he got excited by that. He went, oh, just like the Holy Spirit. I said, exactly, make a right. Okay, chief. And he made a right, and we got our dessert, because that's, that was the final thing, and I wanted that dessert. And I knew what it was. The Holy Spirit of God works in your life in that way. In John 16, verse 7, he's called the helper. Verse 13, he guides us into all truth. Verse 14, he'll always point to Jesus. What Jesus wants loves, desires, and directs us to do. The teaching, moms, the Holy Spirit will orchestrate the whole process and endeavor. He'd like to guide your day today, if you'll let him. The areas where you've backed off and his voice has become very quiet, he would like to re-intensify himself as we confess sin, as we repent as we get closer to him again and say, I want to hear your voice clearly, Lord. I want to obey at this time. I don't want to trip over the same things I've tripped over before. So he encourages, he empowers, he directs, he enables. He gives peace. Don't you love peace? Sometimes that's all we want, is a little bit of peace in our life. The final thing today, the prayer, verse 38. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant or the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. That's all the angel wanted to hear. And the angel departed from her. She was a praising woman. If you read further on, she said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. She loved God. She longed to be used by God. She would give all. If you understand who he is and how finite and temporary we are, you'll give him all. You'll trust him. You'll realize that in a blink of an eye, you'll be in his presence. And we want to do right by God in this life. A definition of her being the handmaid of the Lord, maidservant, personal maid. This was the lowest form of a servant that she claimed to be as she stood before God. She didn't say, "Uh, who will I be again? What will they call me? What will they think? How will I look? What about in the future if you're God? You know, how will I be lifted up? She just said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. 
Be it unto me according to your word. The teaching, whatever. I hate that word. <laughs> whatever. Wherever, whenever my life belongs to you, God, I'm going to wait on your call and your direction. This mom believed this. And I just want to give you a little challenge because for the sake of time and contemplation, I'd like you to look at this, maybe even today at some point. Verses 46 through 55, as Mary speaks to Elizabeth, she says some incredible things about God. Moms, we want you to be incredible. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. You're ordinary. I'm ordinary. But you can be incredible in your belief. Incredible in your faith. Incredible in your Christian attitude. I don't understand it all, but we're going to trust God. We're going to do it His way. I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm still going to walk ahead because I know this is in obedience to Him. Teach these things to your children, to your grandchildren, to the generation to come. Do you know never before in all of history have we been so ignorant of the Word of God? You know, 20 years ago, people might not have been Christians. They still understood the Bible. They still respected the Word of God if you said it was coming out of the Word of God. People know nothing about the Word of God. I'll quote a verse at the hospital and the whole hospital is in shock. How do you do that? How do you come up with that? Was that just in your mind? You know, these are nurses that went to medical terminology. They've got like 2,000 abbreviations memorized. I quote one verse and they're like, oh, you're blowing me away. The things of God, people know nothing about. And it's the most important thing we can embrace. Let's bow our heads and our hearts before God for a moment. Mary had motherhood cast upon her. What a, what a great woman. What a great young girl. Look at the life that she went through watching her son be crucified. Sitting at the dinner table and listening to him talk. Seeing him in the temple with religious leaders wowing them all by his questions and answers. Her own heart being pierced with a sword because of her love for her son. And yet she knew God was in control and God was on his throne. Could we this morning give a little bit of that to God? I want to hear your voice, Lord. I want to be obedient to you. I have messed up in the past. I have tripped over things. But Lord, could we reunite? Could we get close again? Could my ears be open to your voice and your call once again? Maybe that's your prayer today and you'd say pray for me. Anybody like that? doesn't have to just be moms. I see your hands, ladies. Amen. Hands all over. Anybody else? I just want to reunite with the Lord. I want to do things His way. I don't want to make like I'm in control. I want to give Him control. I want to pass on to the next generation the thing that will save them from themselves and from sin and from the wicked one. Pray for me today. Anyone else like that today? Just talk to the Lord quietly. How much quiet time do we get in this world? Push aside the cares of the world. Get close to Jesus. You'll never be called upon like Mary was, but God wants you to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, and He calls it our reasonable service. He died for you. He lives inside of you. Let's live our life for Him. Father, we thank You for the hands that have been raised and we thank You for impressing us with Your Word and with the testimony of people who have done right. 
A priest could not believe the angel of the Lord and was struck dumb. A virgin girl believed that she would be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and give birth to the Messiah. Oh, Father, what did she think as the angels gave this pronouncement? As the shepherds came, as the wise men came, as they had to flee to Egypt because of them being threatened. The ups, the downs, the looking at a little boy who never did anything wrong and never sinned and respected his parents all the time. A little child who looked into his eyes and knew that he knew everything and he was the creator. Her own heart being pierced by the pain she felt for the child she bore, but she realized he was God and belonged to God. Father, change us, please. Give us a little bit of an eternal perspective this morning. Enough that it would change our lives, our decisions, our perception. We love you, and we thank you for loving us first, and help us to realize how great this story is. Bless our moms, our Christian moms that give of themselves and love you and love the children that you've given. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.